and the church often benefited economically from this system through donations, grants, and slave labor. Another reason was the belief among religious leaders that slavery was endorsed and supported by the Bible. Some theologians and religious leaders selectively interpreted biblical passages to justify slavery. They cited verses that appeared to condone slavery or saw Africans as descendants of Ham, cursed by Noah, as theological validation for their subjugation. Fear of disrupting societal stability was also a significant factor. The church was cautious about challenging the status quo, as many religious leaders feared backlash or unrest if they openly opposed the prevailing system. The church's failure to denounce slavery forcefully or unequivocally remains a dark chapter in its history. By not taking a strong stance against this grave injustice, the church missed an opportunity to lead and promote a movement for social justice and equality. It wasn't until after centuries of cruelty and suffering that some Christians and the church began to seriously consider the abolition of slavery. This change was driven by both philosophical and religious reasons, with many Christians at the forefront of the abolitionist movement in Europe and the United States. Prominent figures such as William Wilberforce, Charles Spurgeon, John Wesley, and many others denounced slavery and worked towards its abolition. Quakers, part of the Society of Friends, were early leaders in the abolitionist movement. These Christians believed in the equality of all people and saw the abolition of slavery as a practical application of their faith. Ultimately, the abolitionist movement within the church and society as a whole played a crucial role in bringing an end to the brutal institution of slavery. In 1688, Dutch Quakers from Germantown, Pennsylvania, sent a petition against slavery to the Quaker Monthly Meeting. By 1727, British Quakers officially disapproved of the slave trade. Three Quaker abolitionists, namely Benjamin Lay, John Woolman, and Anthony Bernays, dedicated their lives to this cause from the 1730s to the 1760s. Lay even established the Negro School in 1770, educating over 250 pupils. In June 1783, a petition signed by over 300 Quakers from the London Yearly Meeting was presented to the British Parliament, protesting the slave trade. In 1787, the Society for Effecting the Abolition of the Slave Trade was formed, with nine of its twelve founding members being Quakers. William Wilberforce, a member of the UK Parliament, was persuaded to champion the cause. He introduced a bill to abolish the slave trade, succeeding in 1807 after several attempts with the Slave Trade Act of 1807. The Royal Navy declared slave trading equivalent to piracy, liberating slaves on board and effectively crippling the transatlantic trade. Abolitionist efforts influenced popular opinion against slavery, leading to the outlawing of slavery throughout the British Empire in 1833. However, in the United States, the abolition movement faced significant opposition. In 1835, the American Anti-Slavery Society, AASS, founded by Theodore S. Wright, initiated a postal campaign, sending materials to prominent figures across the country and leading to massive demonstrations. To hinder these mailings, New York Postmaster Samuel L. Gouverneur unsuccessfully asked the AASS to stop sending materials to the South. He eventually decided to prevent the mailing of abolition pamphlets to the South himself. This prompted the AASS to resort to clandestine means of dissemination. Despite fierce opposition, some Methodist, Baptist, and Presbyterian members freed their slaves and supported black congregations. A significant revival in 1801 at Cane Ridge, Kentucky, led American Methodists to make anti-slavery sentiments a condition of church membership. Abolitionist writings, such as those by George Bourne and George B. Cheever, used the Bible, logic, and reason to argue against slavery. Initially, Protestant missionaries during the Great Awakening opposed slavery in the South. However, by the early 19th century, many Baptist and Methodist preachers in the South accommodated it to spread their faith. These differences in views caused schisms within denominations, leading to regional associations by the time of the Civil War. In 1850, in the canonization ball of Peter Claver, Pope Pius IX labeled slave traders as the supreme villainy. In 1888, 
Pope Leo XIII condemned slavery, the church's historical role in supporting and justifying slavery and the slave trade has been a source of deep moral reflection and regret. As society has evolved and our understanding of human rights and justice has advanced, the church has embarked on a path of redemption, seeking to rectify past wrongs and contribute positively to the healing of racial wounds. In 2014, religious leaders from various faiths, including Pope Francis, signed a declaration against modern slavery and human trafficking at the Vatican. The historical relationship between the church and slavery is complex and deeply troubling, but it also serves as a lesson. As brave individuals within the church challenged slavery on moral grounds, the church underwent a transformation. Abolitionists were inspired by Jesus Christ's teachings and a renewed understanding of the Bible's message of love, compassion, and the inherent dignity of all humans. By the 19th century, many Christian denominations were leading the abolitionist movement, advocating for the liberation of enslaved individuals and the dismantling of the institution of slavery. The Church's journey from complicity to advocacy underscores the importance of continuous moral reflection and a commitment to justice in the face of systemic wrongs. Acknowledging past wrongs, the Church seeks reconciliation and healing, providing a lesson for future generations.